Hi, everyone, and welcome to High Performance RAG with Llama Index. My name is Greg Lochnane, and I'm the founder and CEO of AI Makerspace. Thanks for taking the time to join us for this event today. It's 2 p.m. in Dayton, Ohio. Where are you tuning in from today? We're so happy to have folks in our community joining us from all over the world. During our event today, you'll learn about RAG systems, using Llama Index to build them, how to evaluate the retrieval aspect of RAG, and even how to improve retrieval. If you hear anything during today's event that prompts a question, please follow the Slido link in the description box on the YouTube page. We will do our best to answer the most upvoted questions during the Q&A portion of today's event. Without further ado, I'm excited to welcome my good friend, Chris Alexiak, to the stage today. We'll be working as a team, as usual, to deliver today's lesson. Chris is the CTO of AI Makerspace and founding machine learning engineer at Ox. He's an experienced online instructor, curriculum developer, and YouTube creator. Chris embodies AI Makerspace's build, ship, share ethos, and I couldn't be more pumped to kick it with him today. Chris, you ready to build some serious llama indexes today, my man? I am ready to index some llamas, Greg. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, we'll have you back in just a, a few minutes. We've got a little bit of setup today and to make sure that we're all teed up to build everything that we need. In order to talk about high performance RAG, we need to first talk about RAG and we just need to basically make sure we're super clear on what we're turning into a high performance system, which aspects of RAG we're really gonna focus on. We're gonna look at Llama Index, the data framework and its core constructs. We're also gonna actually build a veterinary camelid index, which will have some llamas in it. We're gonna use this particular application to show you how to fine tune embeddings. And we're going to also show you exactly how to evaluate retrieval, a really kind of evolving space within building with LLMs. And then finally, we'll wrap up and have some Q&A. So first, you know, why RAG? Let's make sure that we start it from the top. The big reason is, is that hallucinations are a big deal. When we get confident responses from LLMs, that are clearly false, that's not good, especially if we're doing stuff that gets shown to our users, gets shown to our customers. Rather, it's better if we can have everything that an LLM says fact-checked against our own documents. We really want a keen eye looking at everything that goes in and comes out of our LLMs, especially when we're gonna use them in business contexts. This is where RAG comes in because retrieval augmented generation is exactly about that. It's exactly about fact checking what comes out of an LLM preemptively by putting references in to the LLM. We're using the retrieval process to find references. We're then adding those references to our prompts before we do our generations. And if we do that retrieval correctly and we augment the prompts with the best possible information, we get improved answers. So this is super important, not just in general, but especially in really specialized domains. So domains where you've got a lot of jargon, a lot of mumbo jumbo that people are talking about and using all the time. These words that don't really mean things elsewhere. Uh, if you talk to lawyers, if you talk to doctors, if you work in the government and you're dealing with acronym soup all the time, there's a lot of domains where you really need to learn a special language. This is as true for humans as it is for LLMs. And in order to align with application and context, we need to make sure those LLMs can really interact with that particular domain. Although it's not necessarily just the LLM that has to do this, it's the RAG system. Because the RAG system, again, is about answering questions against documents. 
And if those documents have specialized language, we want to make sure that we're able to look through them and understand that specialized language prior to actually putting anything in to a very, very powerful large language model. RAG can be broken down into two primary pieces. The first piece is the retrieval piece. This is when you're actually using vectors to do the retrieval. The second piece where you're actually augmenting the prompt, that's where you're taking all the information that you have collected and you're putting it into the context window of the LLM. This is the in-context learning piece. We're gonna to focus today on the retrieval aspect. And when we talk about retrieval, there's really only three easy core pieces to retrieval. We ask a question, we search databases or a database that's full of stuff, and we look for stuff that's similar to the question that we asked. We return that stuff, and then we use that to put into our LLM. In order to do this today, oftentimes the database we're using is a vector database, or more generally, we'll call that vector database an index, as there are many different types of indexes, and vector database is just only one type. When we build an index, when we build a vector DB, we split our documents up into chunks. We create embeddings for each of those chunks by putting them through an embedding model. And then we store those embeddings within our index, within our vector store. That's what allows us to then look within our vector store as we ask a question. And this is where the retrieval aspect of RAG comes in. And this is where retrievers in any framework come in. So we ask a question, we convert that question to a vector. We look for similar vectors within our vector database. We return that context before we put it in to our prompt. And so when we talk about dense vector retrieval, we're talking about when we ask a question, it's a vector. When we search a database, it's a vector database. When we look for similarity, we're looking for a vector similarity. But then when we return the stuff that we need, that's going to be a natural language again. So this retrieval piece is going in and finding things, returning them in natural language, just the way we need to interact with the LLM. And so just an overview of the complete process so that we understand which aspects we're trying to advance in today's lesson. We have a query, we send it to the embedding model. We look for similar pieces of information within our vector database. We then take our query and we set up our prompt template so that it's ready to go into the LLM. Just as soon as we find all of that similar information, we rank order it and we put it into the context that we are adding to our prompt. Finally, we put everything in, we stuff it all in to the LLM and we get our answer. So the two pieces that we are talking about here are dense vector retrieval on the one hand and in context learning on the other. Again, we're focused on retrieval today and we're focused on building out a really, really powerful index and retrieval process. This is where Llama Index comes in. Llama Index is a great tool for building very, very powerful indexes and doing retrieval very well. In fact, Llama Index is all about the data. It's not an everything framework, it's a data framework. And it's built upon the idea that it's very hard if you're any reasonably sized company that you're dealing with lots of private or domain specific data that's in different types of databases, in PDF files, in CSV file folders, and in so many different places. All these disparate data sources need to come together into one place that we can work with in a very easy way 
through natural language. That's what everybody wants. And that's what Llama Index is kind of designed to tackle is that particular problem. When we talk about Llama Index, there's one piece of key terminology we need to make sure that we get clear on. It's the idea of documents. In a natural language processing sense, sometimes we say the word documents and we actually mean sort of sentence level information about words. But in Llama Index, that sentence level information, we're gonna use the terminology node to describe it. Nodes are the natural language processing document. So rather than having to say source documents versus documents, as you do often in NLP, we're reserving the word documents for the PDF level document when we talk about Llama Index. But nodes are the important construct here. Nodes are, in fact, a first-class citizen, Llama Index will tell you. Nodes are simply that chunk of source document or simply document. They inherit metadata. They are able to sort of track where it is they came from. And the way that you interact with nodes is very similar to the way that you think about interacting with vectors within a vector store. The nodes are what gets stored within the index, the vector store. When you ask a question, you return all of the K most similar nodes. All those nodes are passed through a response synthesis module that is built into Llama Index. Then you've got your subsequent response. In order to actually create these nodes, we have to parse our data. And that's where node parsers come in. Node parsers are going to be an easy way to sort of play around with different retrieval methods, just as sizing nodes are themselves. So the node parser is actually just what takes your list of documents, PDF level documents, and chunks them out into node objects. You can do chunking in different ways, and there are many different strategies for this. And definitely, that's a great place to start if you're trying to move into more advanced retrieval. But really, the magic in Llama Index happens. Of course, we have retrievers in Llama Index, just as we do in other frameworks like Langchain. And those are focused on nodes here. But the query engine is the really specific Llama Index construct and abstraction that we want to get a handle on and get comfortable with as we're getting into using Llama Index. The query engine is as important to Llama Index as the chain is in LangChain. And so it's just that generic interface that allows you to ask questions over your data, over many different types of data. So there are many types of query engines. And we're going to show you a couple today. We are going to use data that's going to help us learn about camelids. If you don't know about camelids, you probably do know a little something about them from llamas to alpacas to vicunas to guanacos. There are many different types of camelids, many of which you've probably heard the names recently. And what, we're, what we've done is we've actually taken some data from the International Camelid Institute. Shout out to Ohio State where they're focused on the veterinary domain and doing research on camels and camelids in a veterinary capacity. So there are many, many different research papers here. And you can imagine they're full of jargon and specific language that most people have never heard of, including us. So to build this camelid index, what, we've, what we're gonna do is we're going to load documents, we're gonna chunk, our nodes along with their metadata using the node parser in Llama Index. Then we're going to go ahead and create our embeddings and we're gonna store those nodes in our Llama Index vector index. There's one more thing I wanna talk about before we get into the code. And that is, okay, given all this RAG system, given this basics of Llama Index setup we've got going, we also want to think about the purpose of today's event, which is advanced retrieval, which is high performance RAG, which is how to actually improve your retrieval process. And there are a few ways to do this. 
Llama Index put out this great chart just the other day, and they talked about different ways to move from simple to advanced RAG. Of course, the table stakes are there. Use different node parsers, try different chunk sizes. There are different search techniques and different metadata filters that you can imagine putting in there. We encourage you to play with all of those. We're gonna show a couple of the more advanced techniques here today. First and foremost, we're gonna focus on fine tuning. And the reason that we're gonna focus on fine tuning is again, because we have such specialized vocabulary in this veterinary research context. So we wanna make sure that we can first off handle whatever mumbo jumbo is in those papers. In order to do fine tuning, we've seen this before. We've seen this when we did smart rag just a few weeks ago. What we need is we need to develop a training, validation, and testing set of question and retrieved context pairs. Then we can use a loss function that actually takes all positive pairs and also automatically augments our data set with negative pairs, meaning if you ask a question, you could return the wrong context, basically irrelevant context. That would be a negative pair. And this hugging face sentence transformers loss, it's built right in. So it's very nice. We can use this. And it turns out it improves our results. When we use something like the BGE small sentence embeddings from Hugging Face, from BAAI, this is something that is relatively straightforward and also pretty cost efficient as well. So we're going to set out to build our RAG system. But first, we're going to set up Llama Index so that we chunk out some nodes. We're going to create some training, validation, and testing set data to fine tune our embeddings. Then we're actually going to go fine tune those embeddings. And we're going to set up our Camelid specific embedding model and see how it's starting to do just with this very first piece of our advanced RAG setup. So with that, send it off to Chris to show us how all of this looks in code. Thanks, Greg. Yes. So the idea is we are going to improve our embeddings model by fine tuning over some questions that we generate via our, uh, you know, basically our training set. So the idea is that we're going to, you know, use our own data to build a data set to get our embeddings model better at understanding our data. Uh, very fun, very exciting, and uh, we'll get right into what we need to do in the code. First things first, we want to run some boilerplate just so we can run async inside our notebook. We're going to grab our dependencies, OpenAI, Llama Index, and PyPDF. And, of course, we'll need an OpenAI API key. It should be noted that some of the evaluation pieces of this notebook are rather uh, resource-intensive, and so, uh, you know, make sure that you're you're not uh, you know, blowing up your rate limit or anything like that uh, for the later stage of the notebook. I'll make mention of that again when we get to that step. First thing we're gonna do is load data. Uh, we've set up a, uh, you know, a sub directory in our data repository, uh, GitHub, which has all of the potentially relevant data. The uh, data we're gonna be using today is a couple zip files, uh, which have in them a bunch of papers on camelids. So we have our test, uh, you know, zip, and we have our train zip. And you can see we have two papers to eight papers. Uh, and these are all veterinary papers about camelids. So they contain very specific knowledge, both to veterinary and to, uh, you know, camelids. So you know, the model might not have a great understanding of these things on the offset, uh, because it is hyper-specific language to this domain. So how do we actually build that data set, right? So the, we need a data set in order to train. So how do we build it? Well, uh, the first thing we're going to do is split our sources into nodes. We're going to do this using the simple directory loader, which is going to use our simple node parser to parse out our documents into a bunch of nodes. Uh, the idea is that we're going to, you know, turn all of those papers into just a ton of uh, individual nodes where each of those nodes is going to relate to a specific piece of context. So we'll do that here. 
you can see that we convert our two documents into 17 nodes and our eight documents into 155 nodes, which is quite a lot of nodes. And now we're going to actually make the data set, right? So what we have right now is just a bunch of nodes. Uh, and what we want to do is have a bunch of question context pairs. And the way that we're going to generate these is we're going to have OpenAI's GPT 3.5 Turbo through the generate QA embedding pairs, uh, you know, llama index module, it's going to create questions that are relevant to our pairs or to our context. So the idea is we're going to, for each node, have GPT 3.5 Turbo create a question that can be answered by that node. The idea being we want to uh, create, you know, some kind of system that has our you know, each question is related to a specific piece of context. Once we have that, uh, we are good to go. We're going to fine tune uh, using sentence transformers since it's neatly integrated into Llama Index. And we're going to fine tune the BAAI BGE small English 1.5 embeddings model. Uh, you can read more about it on their hugging face card. Uh, we will be using sentence transformers. Having a GPU will make this train go a little bit faster, but it's not completely necessary. You could do this on CPU. It will just take a little bit longer. So uh, you can use the free GPU from Colab to get this done. Uh, Lickety split. What we're going to need to pass into our Sentence Transformers Fine Tune Engine, which is a fantastic module provided by Llama Index, is our training data set, our model ID, which is going to be the hugging face reference to our embeddings model a model output path, which is where our model is going to live, and then a validation data set, which is uh, just a data set that we want to use to potentially validate our uh, embeddings model, which we'll see used in a second. And then the number of epochs we want to trade on. Two is a fine number. You could use you know, three. Uh, you shouldn't go too, too high, though. We don't want to uh, overfit on our uh, data. We, we would like to uh, retain the ability to have good uh, general embeddings while getting better at our domain specific embeddings it loads this all up and then we get to call fine tune and we get to watch the training happen as you can see this did not take very long and the uh we train it up for our two epochs having a great day then we're going to extract our embedded embedding model from our fine tune engine this is our now fine tuned embeddings model and then we're going to evaluate it. Now we're going to evaluate it using the information retrieval evaluator, which is part of a sentence transformers library. The idea here is because we're going to compare our newly fine-tuned embeddings model to our previous base embeddings model, we can use the sentence transformers information retrieval evaluator, which is going to give us a bunch of awesome statistics about how our uh, retrieval process is working. The main stat you're going to see uh, which is the one that's going to be output in the collab cell is mean average precision at K or map at K. The, there are a number of awesome uh, metrics which we can use in this library. Uh, you can see here we have accuracy, precision, recall, MRR, NDCG, uh, and our, you know, what we're using today, which is map. So there's a ton of awesome different metrics we could use, uh, and all of those will be available to you in your Colab environment in the results folder. And you can see in this chart, you have access to every one of them, but by default, it is going to output the uh, map at K uh, for us to see. All this is doing is evaluating, storing the evaluation to an output path, and then returning that evaluator. When it's returned, it's going to populate with the map at K. And you can see that our base retrieval uh, pipeline, which is our uh, you know unfine-tuned BGE small n uh, V1.5, gets 0 0.77 map at K. And our fine-tuned uh, version of the embeddings model gets 0 0.83 map at K, which is quite a significant increase, right? Uh, this is quite a heavy increase for such a low effort, uh, you know, fine tuning, right? This didn't take very long. Uh, we didn't use a lot of data 
we really just uh, generated 150 or so question context pairs and we train it for two epochs and still we get a rather massive increase in our map at K as well as the other statistics if you wanted to look through them in the results folder. Uh, this is a very high return thing to do when you're dealing with domain specific data and even better when we're dealing with the same domain or a single domain uh, throughout the lifetime of an application this is a very powerful tool because you know as we add more veterinary data we can train our embedding on maybe a larger corpus but those gains that we get from fine-tuning our embeddings model are going to persist as we add more and more data since we're staying in the same domain. So this is a very powerful uh, pattern. Uh, it's quite straightforward to implement thanks to Llama Index, and uh, it gives you a, a you know better score. Better score is good. And so we'll go back to Greg, and we'll learn a little bit more about what we will do on the retrieval side. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Super cool to see that great increase and in improvement by just doing that simple, quick fine tuning of the embedding model. So what we're going to do next is now that we fine tuned our embeddings to really align with our veterinary camelid domain here, we're going to pick out one of the advanced retrieval methods here. And this one is called small to big retrieval. The idea being that when we return context, we can look at the area around the context that we've returned. And we can also look through that before we return our final answer. We're going to use a tool called the sentence window node parser. What this tool does is it splits our documents into nodes, of course, but each node here is a sentence. And then what we do is we put a window around each node. We look at a few different pieces on either side of the sentence in question around the node. And we also return any relevant context there. And we can sort of take all of that in one nice little package and return anything relevant. So there are a lot of applications for wanting to do this. You know, the big idea is that once you return just one sentence that is very similar to the query, it's probably placed within a paragraph. And that paragraph is probably placed within a chapter heading. And especially in these research papers, there's headings everywhere. So within context is very, it's a murky term when, when we think about exactly the best way to retrieve any given node from any given type of document. But in this research paper context, we'll see how the sentence window node parser can actually work very well to give us some much better results. We're also going to evaluate exactly how we're doing. And when it comes to evaluating retrieval, there's some recent libraries that we have seen get built right into Llama Index that we wanna show you guys because they're super easy to implement and they're really gonna be kind of a game changer where you used to kind of have to go pull in another tool for this. Now it's built right in. When we talk about RAG evaluation, there are a few pieces of the puzzle in Llama Index. We have correctness, semantic similarity, faithfulness, and context relevancy. So on the generation side, on the sort of answer side that we're getting, we have correctness and semantic similarity. In this case, what we're doing is we're comparing the generated answer to our reference answer. And the reference answer, you might think, well, where does that come from? That's sort of the ground truth. That's sort of the right answer, the correct answer. Now, of course, a lot of times we have not had humans go through and create that ground truth data set, that reference answer. And so what we do is we take the most powerful model we can find, GPT-4, and we use that to create our reference answer. And this is sort of standard best practice within the industry today, especially when it comes to RAG evaluation. On the retrieval side, we've got two other metrics, faithfulness and context relevancy. When we talk about faithfulness, we're really asking the question of, are we seeing a lot of hallucinations? Are we seeing answers that are really not relevant to the context that we've retrieved? If we are, then that would be sort of hallucinatory. 
On the context relevancy side, we're sort of saying, well, are the retrieved context and the answer, are both of them really relevant to the question asked? We want to make sure that this is true. We want to make sure that the question asks, the question asked really is guiding the way. We want to see this visually. You might think about it with this sort of set of four different pieces of information. We've got the question, we've got the generated answer, we've got the retrieved context, and then we've got the reference answer. As I mentioned, we're going to be creating the reference answers with GPT-4. On the top here, you've got our sort of context relevancy and faithfulness, our two retrieval metrics that we're going to look at. So these are really important when we're really analyzing retrieval. However, when you analyze retrieval, presumably downstream during generation, those generations will improve as well. And so when we analyze generation, as we're trying to improve retrieval, we should also expect to see some better results. And when we look at correctness or semantic similarity across generated versus reference answers, in fact, today you will see that we do see some better results. So ideally, any evaluation tools that we pick up, we want to see numbers moving in the right direction. And it's pretty cool that with the Camelid index or with the Llama index that we've created, we are able to do some really advanced indexing here and get some great retrieval results with Llama index. Chris, let's show them exactly how we did it. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the basic idea here is that we are going to be improving the way that we retrieve information. So we've, we've set up a process where we are better at retrieving the correct information or at least relevant information by fine tuning our embeddings model. And now we want to leverage that to retrieve information in a smarter way as well. So the method we're gonna be talking about today is sentence window retrieval, uh, which is this uh, idea of a small to big retrieval process. You know, at a high level, what we're doing is we're gonna parse our documents into sentences, find the most relevant sentences, then add additional context based on a window around those sentences, and then use that context to our LLM for our uh, retrieval augmentation step in the RAG pipeline. Let's look at this with an example. I'm going to zoom out just a, just a bit for a second. So we have this block one, which is going to be, I went to Tashi Station. I bought a power converter. I live on a planet with two moons. My name is Luke Skywalker. If we were to break that apart by sentence, we would have, you know, I went to Tashi Station. I bought a power converter. We, we get it. If we were to chunk that context, we have this, I went to Tashi Station, I bought a power converter. I live on a planet with two moons. My name is Luke Skywalker. And the idea of the sentence-based retrieval process is that what we want to do is we actually want to improve our ability to get similar or correct information based on our query. So like, let's say we ask the question, who bought a power converter, right? If we were to ask that question in the chunking strategy, we would get the context. I went to Tashi Station. I bought a power converter. Well, that doesn't really tell us who bought a, a, you know, a power converter versus if we use this sentence window approach, we would find the sentence, I bought a power converter. And let's say that our window is three. We would increase our context to, I went to Tashi Station. And we would also add, I live on a planet with two moons, and my name is Luke Skywalker. This is going to retrieve the correct context for us, since the context we were looking for was near to the query, but it wasn't the query itself. And this is why this is such a powerful retrieval pattern, right? Basically, what we're doing is we're looking for a needle in a haystack, and then we're expanding our window based off of that. Another really relevant example is say you wanted to know a, a, a uh, you know, an equation from a textbook, right? Well, an equation is not, it doesn't self-define a lot of the time, right? Uh, the equation is uh, built of variables and some such, and the, you know, description of the equation might be in the paragraph preceding the equation. This is an example from uh, Jason. Uh, they're, they're awesome. But the idea is, 
we want to find the equation. And so we look for the actual word, you know, say uh, Pythagorean theorem. And then we expand our context to include the equation itself. Very powerful pattern. And thanks to Lama Index, extremely straightforward to, uh, to, to use. So we're going to use the sentence window parser from defaults. We're going to use a window size of six. This is another great place where we can actually, uh, you know, fine tune our system. This, this window size is going to, you know, shrink or expand the amount of context we include in the window. So this can be used to control cost. Or maybe we want to retrieve a bunch of different nodes with smaller windows as opposed to one node with a large window. We're going to have the window metadata key be window and the original text metadata key be original text. We need this for the second step of our sentence window parser pipeline, which is going to be the metadata replacement. What this is going to do is it's going to associate each of these original texts with a window of size six uh, around our context. So each original text will be associated with a particular window, uh, and that will be useful in a moment. We'll create our simple node parser. We'll create our base LLM, GPT-35 Turbo, of course. We'll set up some fine-tuned uh, embeddings, some base embeddings, and then the relevant contexts. This is just for evaluation later. We want to compare these two pipelines together. Next up, we're going to create some nodes from our documents. First, we're going to need to load our data from our directory, which has all those llama papers. Then we're going to parse out nodes using our sentence window parser and then our simple node parser. Next, we'll just convert those to vector store indexes because, of course, we should. After that, we're going to create our query engine. You'll notice that we have this metadata replacement post processor. So what we're going to do is we're going to retrieve the top three most similar sentences and then replace them from their original text version to their window version. So this means we'll find three sentences and then we'll actually use the context that's in that window, which is the expanded context. So let's see this thing in action. Uh, we'll ask it a query. You know, how do Camelid genetics influence wool quality? Which apparently they do, a bunch of papers on it. So that's cool to know. Camelid genetics play a significant role in determining wool quality. And it goes on and on. It says a bunch of stuff about keratin associated proteins, you know, hair follicle growth, all kinds of stuff. I have no idea what it means, uh, but that's what we build our retrieval augmented generation pipeline for. Uh, it's able to parse through those papers and give us a very, uh, a very good answer. So let's look at a visual representation of what happened. Well, we found our original text. This is our, our zero source node, which is going to be the sentence, just this little bit here. And then we expanded it using our window to be this entire context here. So as you can see, we added a lot more relevant context to our window and we looked on either side and it does look like we added a bunch of information that was helpful, right? So uh, we added this idea of uh, what colors are impacted, you know, uh, the domestication was a factor, all of this other, uh, you know, awesome context that helps us give a really full answer to the question. And then we can go on and see the question or the response we get from just normal chunking. And you can see that like, you know, we get these genetic uh, variations and we get this, uh, you know, these acronyms and these high glycine. Okay. That's great. Have been, you know, all this stuff is great, but we lose a lot of that additional relevant context, like the domestication process and all kinds of other things. So this is why that uh, that method is so powerful, right? Oftentimes, what we're looking for is going to be around our context uh, window. It might not be in it to, at, a, at the start. The next thing we're going to do is evaluate just how much better this is. So in order to do that, we're going to set a number of evaluation nodes. We're going to set a uh, grab a random sample of those nodes from our base nodes. We're going to uh, set up our GPT-4 powered evaluation context. So this is going to be using GPT-4. We're going to create our data set generator, which is going to create question context pairs again. We can see these generated here. Then we're going to uh, change 
a little bit what we're doing by adding evaluators. And these evaluators are going to mark the various responses based on certain criteria. So let's look at, say, the uh, correctness evaluator, right? If we look in the actual code, uh, we can see that there is this prompt, and the prompt basically is asked to mark or score how correct the response is based on GPT-4's uh, understanding. So this is going to do the same thing for each of these metrics. Very powerful pattern. Uh, it's going to help us get some really good understanding of what's happening in these pipelines. We're going to only evaluate on 15 samples. If you're using uh, you know, GBT4, uh, you've just set it up. I recommend moving this down to, say, two samples so you don't hit any rate limit issues. And all we have to do now is get our query engine to answer all of the question and context pairs that we created. So we do this here. We do the same thing for our base RAG pipeline, which is just our base query engine with non-fine-tuned embeddings. We're going to parse out some uh, of the string responses, and then we're going to have GBT4 evaluate based on the uh, metrics we set up earlier, which is correctness, faithfulness, relevancy, and semantic similarity. And then we get to look at our results, and we see the... Uh, the rather impressive difference between the two, our base retriever with base embeddings scores much lower on correctness, relevancy, faithfulness, and then, you know, is similar on semantic similarity. The big benefits here, though, is, you know, maybe for a toy example, these numbers are close, but when it comes to a, an example that's going to span, you know, in production, we're dealing with millions of queries, these kinds of uh, metric increases are fantastic. Uh, they really powerful signal to indicate that our RAG pipeline is going to be performing better at the end of the day uh, than when we started. And that is how we create the advanced retrieval side of the pipeline and how we can evaluate our pipeline using Llama Index. And we'll go back to Greg to close us out. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That was totally awesome. Great to see how we can improve our pipelines and take a look at that qualitatively, but also quantitatively by simply that small to big approach combined with fine tuning embeddings, we were able to go from low numbers on correctness, semantic similarity, faithfulness and relevancy to higher numbers. And the numbers didn't improve drastically in all cases, for instance, semantic similarity. But we do see, again, we're focused on retrieval here, Recall that the retrieval metrics are faithfulness and relevancy. So the faithfulness went way up. We're decreasing hallucinations, presumably a lot when we use this method. And the relevancy also went up quite a bit. Again, we're focused on retrieval, but we also saw improvements in our generation metrics. Very cool to check this out and see how easy it is to get going. And the idea is, again, as Chris said, once you have many, many documents, you'll probably start to see some of these numbers level out. You'll start to see that you are sort of demonstrating and gaining a mastery over the language in your particular domain with the embedding model approach or even with the type of retrieval for a specific document type approach that you're using. Of course, putting all this together with different types of documents that are structured in different ways and looking across all of them is sort of another level as we get into more and more advanced retrieval and production. But for today, we have seen that there are many ways to enhance retrieval. We saw just a few today, small to big and fine tuning embeddings. The fine tuning embeddings is really something that's recommended for very specialized vocabulary or sort of veterinary camelid or llama index was a great example of how we can do this. We saw the generation metrics improve with retrieval, even though we were just really aiming at retrieval. And evaluation is easier than ever. Although you do want to note that GBT4 is often still used as ground truth. One of the common questions we get is, well, isn't it 
kind of sketchy to get GPT-4 analyzing the output of another LLM and doing that sort of self-assessment? Not really, because it turns out GPT-4 is actually very good at self-assessment in general. So this is why it's sort of okay and accepted in the industry today to go ahead and do this. So with that, we'll go ahead and spend the last 15, 14, 15 minutes or so answering everyone's questions. We'll leave this Slido QR code up on the screen for just a few moments while I welcome Chris back to the stage. And then we'll have a small QR code show up in the right-hand side of your screen once this drops away. So Chris, let's go ahead and dive into it, man. Islam, guys, got some popular questions here. He asks, in the case of documents containing graphs, tables, or images that contain important information, what happens to the nodes? Yeah, they're parsed in like whatever format you use. So PDF is parsed to, to plain text. Uh, images would be a, a large part ignored. Uh, basically, they're, they're, you, they use a PDF parser to, to parse those, uh, those, you know, whatever, in the case of PDFs. Um, so it depends on what parser you're using. Uh, you can build kind of like, uh, you know, your own parser or a custom parser that might be able to, to store that information in a more, uh, in, a, in a better way or in a, a way that you're, you more prefer. But uh, for the basic parsers, they, things like images are ignored and tables are converted to plain text tables and uh, graphs are, again, largely ignored. Yeah. And this is something that everybody asks, right, Chris? It's like, how do I get everything in my PDF doc to show up beautifully, just right with a simple let's say node parser when it comes to Llama index, a very, very hard problem. It's going to require digging down into each type of data that's within that PDF and figuring out what the, you know, not fun data pipeline to get it right actually looks like. All right. Islam asks another question here. What would the main difference be between Langchain retrievers and Llama index retrievers? To me, they look almost the same. Am I missing something? Not in particular, no. Uh, they're they're maybe implemented in different ways, or they have specific, uh, you know, uh, framework, uh, you know, integrations. So, like Langchain's retrievers are going to integrate very well uh, in the Langchain ecosystem. But for the most part, like they're they're all doing the same thing. I would say they're are some differences in terms of which uh, retrievers are available and which methods they are implemented with. So you might have more performant retrievers uh, in, in some cases between the two, right? Langchain might have a more performant implementation of a specific retriever uh, and Llama index vice versa. Uh, but for the most part, you know, for the basic retrieval processes are gonna be the same. It more comes down to the availability of built-in retrieval pipelines. Llama index has a lot of retrieval pipelines that work in a number of awesome ways. So as you move past the simple retrieval uh, processes, you're going to see uh, some some pretty significant differences between the two. Hmm. Hmm. And it does seem like like Llama Index is really doubling down on on retrieval in these days, right? So I would expect they, to see more and more all the time. I mean, everybody, yeah. is, but you know, and they play nice together. I mean, at the end of the day, Llama yeah. Index, uh, you know, you can implement Langchain. Uh, right in it. So for the most part, you know, you can you can plug and play with either of them. So I would say, you know, they do have differences and it can be important to know those differences, but uh, the, the libraries play very well together. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think often there's this either or thing about it and, you know, it's it can be either or it can be both. And uh, as you get more advanced, you're likely to try out both of them and see what works best for your use case. Porque no los dos, right? Yes. So. <laughs> URL to the collab got you. Um, that should be in the YouTube link chat. Ma uh, Manny, the Neo Matrix 369 here asks, could you please share with us free slash open source LLM models that we could use for performant embedding and chat models? Like what, what do you recommend, Chris? Like if people are going to get started. What should we recommend for Manny here? Well, you go to the MTEB, the uh, Massive Text Embedding Benchmark, 
Uh, you find the task you want to be good at, and then you click the one at the top. Uh, you know, that's that's what I would suggest. Unironically, uh, you know, in terms of the your ability to create or to to get open source embeddings models, there is a you know we are spoiled for choice. Uh, you know, you can get ones that are very good at a specific subtask that you want to be good at. You can get different languages. You can get multilingual. I mean, the the sky's the limit on embeddings models right now. And uh, as long as you, uh, you know, really understand what is best for your use case, you're going to be able to find a performant free embeddings model. No probs. And the benefit, of course, to all these open source models is that you can fine tune them to be very good at whatever domain. So if you see one that's good at a task, uh, you know, uh, use it and then fine tune it and boom, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think too, like, you know, it depends on the use case. Like uh, we've talked to a number of uh, government agencies recently, and they're very averse to using embedding models that come out of Chinese companies or nonprofits, for instance, uh, because it's actually against the rules in their particular domain. And so you kind of have to look, it, it really depends. And, and I do think still we, we are seeing a lot, and this is true in Lama Index blogs and in our own work, that the OpenAI embeddings model is really good, right, Chris? I mean, it's just, it's very good. And so if you're looking for like performant embeddings models and performant chat models, um, it's hard to say don't start with OpenAI. Um, if you really have to be open source, yeah, go ahead and Look at that massive tech embeddings benchmark leaderboard. Look at the open LLM leaderboard on Hugging Face and, and away you go. So, all right, let's keep it moving here. Iona asks, what is a cost efficient method to train the LLM on personal company documents? In other words, to embed to LLM company knowledge and documents. What is a cost efficient method to train the LLM on personal docs to fine tune the LLM? Yeah, so there isn't one yet. Uh, you know, we don't really want to. I mean, th so the whole point of the RAG system or Raka or end to end RAG or DALM or Raditz, whatever version where, you know, you want to use, the whole idea is that we don't really want to or need to embed knowledge into our LLM. We want to use the uh, the retrieval pipeline to store that knowledge and then make our uh, make our um, you know pipeline more robust. So we can fine tune the LLM at being better at the domain specific retrieval. Uh, so for instance, you know uh, uh, RCAI has a good pipeline for this with their DOM uh, process. You know Raditz, which just came out, is great for this. But we really more often want to improve the efficacy of our retrieval pipeline through methods like better retrieval, fine-tuning our embeddings models, uh, then we do fine-tune our LLM to, to, to memorize our company's knowledge. Um, so that, that, that's how I'd answer that question. And hopefully what you take from it is that these pipelines like RAG or whatever version you're using are meant to bypass that step. Uh, though we can still fine tune the LLM to be better at our retrieval uh, stack. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And trying to figure out what exactly the order of operations is when we're doing RAG and then fine tuning embeddings versus fine tuning LLMs versus all of these other things we can do. It's often a little bit confusing, but yeah, I think if you take the approach we took today, if you're looking at really specific language, start with the embeddings models and see how far you can get by really dialing in that RAG system. Is any of this applicable in RAG with structured data involved, Chris? It's like SQL data? Sure. Yes. Uh, mostly. So in, in structured data, we can use other techniques to, uh, you know, say query a database or, or what have you. Uh, but we still oftentimes want to augment that with some kind of semantic information or otherwise, uh, you know, improve the response with some kind of text context. So, yeah, you, you can use these if you're just purely going to be using 
uh, a natural language interface for like a SQL database, then probably not. Uh, you know, we're we're going to be in that case just making SQL and then uh, you know communicating about a natural language. But in kind of the the standard, I, I would say rag application where you're going to further augment that SQL response uh, with natural language. Yes, it absolutely can help. Um, you know, things like knowing what documents to retrieve based on what you get from your SQL response. Uh, both of these techniques can help. Uh, and also adding additional context, semantic context uh, via a separate, uh, you know, pipeline, retrieval pipeline. Both of these are going to add better, smarter context that can augment further the the quantitative results you get from your your SQL query. Yeah, very cool. All right, we've got a quick one here. Can you use an open source LLM, say Llama 270B, to construct a training data set? Why not? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, your mileage may vary. I'm not going to tell you uh, it's going to be like the best or the worst, but you can. Yes, definitely. You can use any sufficiently large language model to create a good data set. You can use any language model to create a data set. Uh, you know, the, the quality is really what we're, we're concerned with. Um, and something like Llama 70B, that's instruct uh, That's very good instruction following. And, you know, it would probably do a great job. Uh, I haven't personally used this pipeline, so I don't want to speak to it exactly. And it's going to vary by the domain you're in and everything. Uh, you know, the, the classic ML answer of it depends, but uh, it can absolutely be a substitution for, say, GPT-4 or GPT-3.5 Turbo, especially for the question generation component. Um, yeah, absolutely, for sure. And uh, we, we kind of touched on this already, but maybe this is a great place to end on how to select an embedding model for a given application and fine tuning. There are so many of them, and maybe, Chris, maybe you can just sort of touch on just how did you select BGE small today, for instance? Uh, I went to MTEB and I looked at the top results and I found uh, the smart, the first best small uh, embeddings model. Uh, I didn't want to use a very large one because I didn't want to necessitate, you know, using a, a big, uh, you know, GPU. And so there you go. That was that's that's really it. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, I know it's yeah. it, it sounds silly, but that's they've 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 already made the the benchmark for us, right? So let's just use it. It's, there it is. Uh, there you go. There it is. And uh, just one one last comment to share, Chris, before we wrap up. Todd LLM says, "I love the use of embodied for the Chris LLM smiley face." Relaxed smiley. Shout out to Todd, uh, great great community member at AI Makerspace. Uh, thanks for engaging with us today. And Chris, thanks so much. Um, we'll go ahead and close her out here. All right. That was awesome. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. This brings us to the end of today's event brought to you by AI Makerspace. We're really excited to announce our brand new three-week course on LLM engineering, which focuses on the foundations of GPT models. It kicks off November 2nd, 2023 at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. It's designed for practitioners like you looking to master the why and how of LLMs from architecture to unsupervised pre-training, supervised fine-tuning, and alignment techniques, including RLHF. If you're looking to get started down the path of becoming an AI engineer, it's probably worth checking it out. For everything else, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And until next time, we'll keep building, shipping, and sharing. And we hope to see you do the same. Thanks so much, everybody.